So, with no further ado, I'd like to ask to our stage our friend, Varun Vaid. He will be talking about the Asian market. Varun has been has more than 20 years of experience in textile strategy development and market research and regulation associated with the sector in a number of countries. He's also the business director at Wazir Advisors in India. And he is a consultant for Cotton Brazil and he helps us uh, to look at the destination countries and to help explain to our clients how, we, how they can work with Brazilian cotton. So Varun, please, if you may. Thank you all for being here today. I'd like to begin uh, by thanking uh, the organizers, Anya. A personal thanks to Mr. Miguel Faust, Abrapa, uh, Mr. Alexander Shanke for inviting me over to share some of my thoughts on the evolving textile industry landscape. Without further ado, I'll just start into the presentation. So what I'll be presenting today are four basic ideas. First is the global market overview. We, as a part of the cotton industry, are part of the value chain which caters to one of the basic necessities of life, that is clothing. So just to give you an idea how big the industry is, how much it is growing, where it is growing, which countries are doing what. So I'll be covering that. The second would be the trends impacting the industry. How the industry will shape up in the next five to 10 years what are going to be the growth drivers that I'll be covering, followed by specifically the immediate buyer for your product, what is happening in the spinning side of this value chain, and finally, what do we see from a perspective of Brazilian cotton? Is it truly aligned with the growth pattern that we anticipate or not? Okay, <clears throat> so if you look at the global clothing market at retail level, so the biggest consumer is America, which has a, almost a consumption of $290 billion. The total market of apparel is estimated to be $1.7 trillion, which has been growing not at a very good rate because of pandemic and everything, but in the next seven years, it is expected to reach almost $2.3 trillion. So what it means is that in the next seven years, there will be a market addition of $600 billion. So that is the first and foremost thing that we need to understand, that we are part of a, a tri $1.7 trillion market that is growing. And the countries beyond America which are consuming largest are definitely Europe as a, as a zone, followed by China, India, then UK, Japan, Canada, and Brazil as of course. Uh, now, textiles is not a localized industry. So, cotton is grown in Brazil, it gets transferred to maybe Vietnam for spinning. From Vietnam, the fabric is moved to Bangladesh for garmenting, and then it goes to maybe Germany for consumption. So, it's a kind of a global value chain, and there's a lot of cross border transactions which happen. So, the trade is very important, the global exports are very important. Right now, the trade is almost 900 billion dollars so whatever we are exporting four or five billion dollar worth of fiber from brazil is also included in that but the industry is huge it is more than 900 billion dollar the trends project that this trade will also increase it will increase to almost 1.2 trillion dollars so by next seven years we'll have additional 300 billion dollar of trade right now we are at 900 but we'll grow at 1200 billion dollars one very important thing talking about Asian markets, if you look at the last few years trend, who has achieved what? So Asian economies have emerged as clear winners in the global market. If you look at the last 20 years data, we see that Bangladesh used to have an export of only $4 billion and it has become $51 billion. So that's almost a 12-fold increase in a period of 20 years. The second winner is Vietnam 
Vietnam used to have an export of only $3 billion, and it has become $35 billion. Then comes Cambodia from $1 billion to $14 billion, then India and Turkey and so on and so forth. In the last five years, if we talk about, again, the winners are more or less same. We see Pakistan coming up a little bit because it is doubled export, Poland, but broadly you can see Bangladesh, Vietnam, Turkey. So these are the emerging countries which have grown their apparel exports. And these are the ultimate markets which we need to cater to. What about the losers who have lost in this game? If you look at the losers in the last 20 years, Canada's trade declined from $1.7 billion to almost negligible now. Taiwan was around $2 billion, it has come down. So as South Korea, Dominican Republic, Philippines, five is also the same. So what we see here, on the left side of the uh, slide, we have emerging Asian countries. And on the right hand side, we have developed countries from Europe, from Americas, where the cost of manufacturing is continuously increasing. So there's a clear shift of manufacturing from the Western countries, from developed countries into Asian countries, which are emerging. And, but what are the reasons why these countries have actually been able to tap into this market? What are the strengths? So I've just tried to map what are the various strengths of individual country. If we talk about China, so there are six fundamental uh, uh, parameters on which a country can dominate the market. One is the raw material availability. We are talking about cotton, we are talking about polyester, viscose. Then manpower availability, very important because textile is a manpower oriented industry. We need a lot of manpower to cut and sew, to run the machineries, etc. Then wage cost. Traditionally, the textile industry has always gone to the place where it could be produced cheapest. So cheap Wage cost is also very important. Then presence of entire value chain. We need to have yarn, fabrics, garmenting, everything within the country. Economies of scale, and then product design and development. So if we see all the parameters, except wage cost, China is competitive in every, every place. So the wage cost in China is almost like $600, but in other parameters, it is, it is perfectly fine. If we talk about India, India, the issue is economies of scale and uh, product design and development is also not that great, but on the four parameters, it scores quite high. The other Asian countries, if you look at Turkey, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or Vietnam. So if you see here, what we can see is that the first raw metal availability is almost everywhere except Bangladesh and Vietnam. These are smaller countries. They do not have the soil where Cotton can be grown to a large extent. They also do not have polyester factories, but they have done wonders. The second row, if you see manpower availability, that is common. In all of these countries, manpower availability is quite huge. Some of them do not have wage cost, good wage cost, but that's manageable because of productivity. And so these are the parameters. So I'll come to the point where Brazil stands, where the other countries stand, but these are the success factors for uh, different Asian countries. One very important factor for these countries is the support of government that is being given to the industry. It's very important and somehow uh, it gets a little uh, sidelined because of other things that we see, oh, the labor wage is very less, uh, they have too many people, etc. But the governments in all these countries have been very, very actively promoting and supporting the industry to a number of ways. For example, I'll just give one example, let's say if we talk about India, so the government understands that they need to support the industry. So they have supported through creation of mega textile parks. So what they have done is they have outlined a thousand acre area and given all kind of common infrastructure, for example, uh, effluent treatment plants, roads, power at the doorstep, etc. So that is one thing. Second thing that they have done very recently is they have given special support for anybody who wants to get into synthetic fiber. So India is also very well known for its cotton textiles, but uh, synthetics is not big, so they are doing that. Then we also have a big support for training of the manpower to produce efficiently. And then there are additional incentives at the state level also. Similarly, if you look at Bangladesh, the exporters get cash incentive for the government exports. There are special incentives for new market beyond Europe, beyond US. 
and so and so forth. Even for China, there are capital subsidies available. In Vietnam, there are tax exemption and preferential rates. So one of the key factors is that governments want to support the industry, and that is why the industry has grown. Why, why, why do they do it? What is the reason that government actually support the industry, textile industry specifically? For developing countries, it is very important that they provide this industry to attract investment. So what they do is they create a policy framework which works on four things. They try to increase the investments in the country. They improve the manpower skills, aimed at improving the availability of trained manpower. Trained manpower. Better market access, they are very actively working towards signing free trade agreements. India is in talk with UK to get free trade agreement. Bangladesh already has zero duty access to Europe. And then a strong ecosystem where people can just come in and start up the business really well. So, so this textile industry holds a very, very special importance for all the developing countries, whether it is Asia or Africa or anywhere. So three fundamental things what textile industry brings that no other industry can bring. First of all, it has the highest employment generation capability. If we want to, if we, if we invest $1 million in garment manufacturing, we are able to generate almost 400 to 450 jobs. Compare it to investing $1 million in phone manufacturing, we'll be generating 30 to 35 jobs, less than one-tenth. And if we inv invest $1 million in automobile industry, we'll only generate five to seven. So for developing countries, unemployment is a big problem. If the unemployment rate is like 8%, 10%, then you need to have capital invested in a sector where employment can be high. And that is the problem which gets solved by textile industry. Second thing, export opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, the current global trade in textile is $900 billion. If a developing country wants foreign currency, then again, garments is the go-to industry. What we are seeing here is the next seven years, there is a $300 billion worth of market addition. So you get employment, you get meaningful forex. And the third thing is value addition. This is very important to understand. Right now as Brazil is exporting fiber without any value addition. So if you look at the value chain, uh, the value addition chain, so for one kg, uh, one ton of raw cotton, if we just try to do equivalent, what we see here is that instead of $200, $2,000 worth of goods, if we convert it fully, the ultimate price could be 11,500. So there's a kind of a 4x value addition which happens if we move from fiber to yarn to fabric to garment. So the countries which are producing cotton, India and China particularly, are never keen, even Uzbekistan for that matter, are not keen on exporting the raw fiber because they want the employment to be generated because they want forex to be generated and then they get advantage of the value addition. For example, if you are exporting, let's say about give or take $4 billion worth of cotton fiber, somebody in Asia is converting that and making 16 billion worth of revenue based on the cotton that is being exported from Brazil. Of course, you also have an industry which is there, so there the value addition is there, but the value addition possibility is huge. So three reasons are fundamental why Asian countries are focused on this value chain. Employment, foreign exchange, and value addition. Moving on to the trends impacting the industry, what we see is there are four major trends which are going to have a large impact on the industry in next 10 years. First is China plus one. So, well, everybody must have heard is that China is losing share in the global market. So if you look at the data here, very simple data, how 10 years, in 10 years, what has, what has been the share of China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, we see clearly that China has lost share. From 36% share in 2012, the share has declined to 31%. Very important to note here is that their value has not gone down. They are still growing in numbers from 148 to 169 but the share is coming down. And who is benefiting out of that? Bangladesh and Vietnam. Those are the two countries which have benefited from China vacating some share. What are the reasons why China's share is coming down? One is definitely the cost of manufacturing is growing over there. Compared to Bangladesh, it is expensive. Compared to Vietnam, it is expensive. Then there are certain tariffs and trade concerns. There have been issues with 
uh, Xinjiang cotton. There are geopolitical concerns also. There was a full-fledged US-China trade war which happened. And then the buyers, when I talk about buyers, I mean the ultimate brands and retailers, Marks and Spencer, H&M, Gap, etc. They're also looking for diversity because they understand that taking 40, 50, 60% from China may not be sustainable in long term. So they're looking for different options. People are talking about nearshoring also that they, instead of going to Asia, can they have uh, products manufactured within the zone? Europeans, could they do it in East Europe or Turkey? American brands, could they do somewhere in Kafta region? So those are some of the concerns which are going on. The second is, uh, goes without saying, is the sustainability. Uh, all the stakeholders, three stakeholders, consumers, brands, and policymakers, all want sustainability to be imbibed in the value chain. Uh, you would already know that large fashion brands and retailers, they have very ambitious trade targets. You take up any website, open any website, corporate website of any brand, they will say, we will be net zero by 2030, 2035. We'll use only recycled polyester by 25, 2030. So they have really ambitious target. So if you need to meet those targets, they're pushing the value chain. They're pushing like people like you in the value chain to produce more sustainability, to use more sustainable material. The consumers are also getting aware, especially in the Western world, they are looking for sustainable product. They are concerned whether the production has been done in a sustainable manner or not. So they are also contributing to this cause. And finally, the sustainability mandates, like for example, much talked about EU strategy for sustainable and circular textiles. This is going to have a very far reaching impact on the entire value chain. Uh, yeah. The third trend, digitalization. Now what is happening is that while textile is a manpower intensive industry, but to be very frank, managing manpower is a very tedious job. The wages are always increasing, but the productivities do not increase. So for let's say for the same job which was being done five years ago, you might be paying double the cost. So people across the value chain, like in spinning, in weaving, in garmenting, are focusing more and more use of digital tools. Uh, and like for example, blockchain technology is one which uh, people like Lensing are using. The artificial intelligence is also getting used, for example, in the uh, identification of, let's say, faults in the fabric, so there are to softwares and there are mechanisms which are available to do that. Uh, augmented reality and virtual reality is what the brands and retailers are playing with to find the right fit for the consumer. And internet of things which enables automated monitoring of the machinery whether for any type of manufacturing. So these are coming bigger and better in the textile industry which will again cause some of the higher cost manufacturing destination to also become competitive. And last but not the least, strategic partnership for consolidation. Now the buyers, the fashion brands and retailers, their core business is retailing. They don't want to get too much into the supply chain managing, where you should source from, what should be the process, what should be certifications. Their core is retail. So what they are preferring these days is that they want to consolidate their buyer base. They want to buy more from fewer suppliers. So what we see is a very clear trend. Let's say, for example, uh, in 2022, Levi's increased its sourcing from a particular country from 20% to 25%. So they are trying to play with smaller players, to work with smaller number of players. Guess another uh, uh, fashion brand reduces vendors, which used to be 500 in 2010 to almost 135 by end of 2022. So there's a kind of a very clear consolidation which is happening. So you work with smaller player, but you work with very work very deeply with them. Then coming on to the spun yarn sector overview, what is happening in the spinning, which is your immediate buyer. Specifically, I'll talk about Asia, what is happening, and in something in Brazil also. But before that, a little, uh, I would say, uh, a couple of slides on cotton vis-a-vis -vis synthetics. So that is a, something which we keep on talking about it. So what we see here is the middle one is cotton, right? So that's a kind of cotton consumption data uh, where we see that the demand of cotton is hovering in the range of 25 million kg. Now this demand is flat not because the consumers don't want it. It is flat because there are no countries which are able to supply it. 
So what we call as a cellulosic gap is there. If you look at the projection over 2030, this is done by Wood McKinsey. So what they say is that there is a potential demand of cotton from 26 million tons to 32 million tons. So 6 million ton additional will be there, but that is only potential. So if the fiber is available, there is a demand. So that's the biggest thing that we need to understand is that synthetic fibers or man-made fibers were always supposed to be replacement of natural fiber, one or the other natural fibers. Because natural fibers were not available, because they were expensive, that's why people shifted to synthetic fibers. This will keep on happening in future also. If the cotton production area global doesn't go up, if the productivity doesn't go up, then the share of synthetics will keep on growing. The prices of cotton will increase, people will be forced to switch to synthetics, so that will keep on happening. But if the potential output can be increased, then there is a latent demand of this much cotton. Uh, this is something similar. What I'm mentioning is that it is the limited supply of natural fibers that has driven the market towards synthetic fibers. Of course, functionality also have to play. If you're looking for, a, let's say, a sports wear, cotton might not be very suitable for the application. But broadly, for most of the application, cotton is the preferred fiber. Uh, it is the higher price due to supply crunch over the last 10, 15 years, which has accelerated the shift to synthetics. Whenever the prices are high, the spinning mills switch to polyester cotton or 100% polyester. So that creates a kind of an issue over there. If the prices are stabilized, which depends on the output of the total industry, then definitely there is a potential to increase. Now, Brazil being emerging in last 10, 15 years as a key player and adding to the global volume and pushing it, pushing the levels every year, passing year, the volumes are increasing. So there, definitely it could enhance the global cotton supply leading to stable prices and which in turn can increase the global cotton demand. Okay, then coming to the spinning side of it, if you look at the last seven, eight years trend, these are the, on the left hand side, this is the installed capacity of spinning in the world. So in last six, seven years, almost eight million spindles have been added at the global level. And which are the countries which have added that? On the right hand side, we can see that China actually the spindle capacity has come down to a certain extent. Almost eight million dollars, eight million spindles have come down. India is the second largest in terms of spindle addition. It added six million spindles in last six, seven years. Bangladesh uh, also is backward integrating. It was known for garments, it is going into spinning. So it has added four million. Then comes Pakistan, Turkey, Indonesia, Vietnam. And Brazil also stands at the uh, eighth position. And the spindle edge has actually declined to a certain extent. Right now it is only 6 million spindles and it has also declined in last uh, last seven years. So again, what clearly comes out is that while the spindles are continuously being added, they are being added in smaller Asian countries. China is, you know, not adding. They are replacing definitely every year they are investing in spinning, but it's more of a replacement rather than absolute capacity addition. Three countries to watch out, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam uh, and Uzbekistan, four countries. This is a study done by uh, ITMF, International Textile Manufacturers Federation, which talked about how competitive it is to manufacture yarn in a particular country. On right hand side, we can see the most competitive manufacturers, India and Vietnam. So this was a study where they compared 30s ring spun and 20s open end yarn. So we can see that India and Vietnam, where the cost of Yarn is almost one dollar and ten cents. On the left hand side, we can see that Indonesia, Central America, and Brazil even the cost of manufacturing is very high compared to the Asian countries. So that's the problem. Even the landed duty paid cost from Asian countries somewhere in Central America proves to be much cheaper. So the cost of manufacturing is very high in these countries. And what are the factors? What has led to this manufacturing cost? Again, I've plotted four important costs for a spinner. The wage rate, the power cost, interest rate, and last but not the least, the cotton price. So what we see here, the green ones are the preferred ones. If you look at the column of Brazil, we see that there is nothing what we can say as a very good competitiveness in terms of whether it is wage rate, or the power cost, or interest rate, or the cotton price. So the Asian countries, on the other hand, have some advantages 
on all these four parameters. So these are some things to be understood why we are not competitive or from a perspective, if we want to develop our spinning industry, if we want to increase our competitiveness, what are the factors we should be tackling on? This, this report was done in 2022. So of course the prices of cotton might change definitely, but there'll be no surprise. If it is one is going down, then everything goes down. If one goes up, it goes everything goes up in other country. So the ranking will broadly be the same. India, Vietnam would be the first, followed by China, Turkey, and Mexico. Uh, final section is Brazilian cotton. Um, I'll not get too much into this data. This data is very well known that uh, you are the third largest uh, producer and uh, hopefully the largest exporter of cotton by this year. So uh, market share also is uh, increasing every with every passing year. I'll not spend too much data here. Um, again, this data will be very well known. China is your biggest market, followed by Vietnam, Bangladesh, Turkey, Indonesia and Pakistan. So these are the six markets. Uh, what we are doing is, as, a, as Wazir advisors, as a company, uh, we are working with Abrapa to identify what is the perception of Brazilian cotton in all the six markets that we talked about. So we have been speaking to some of the spinners in all these markets like Turkey, uh, China, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, we are still doing. We have spoken to some people in Indonesia and Vietnam. So we are doing this assignment to understand what is the perception of Brazilian cotton, what do people think about it. So I'd like to share very few initial findings from the survey. So what are the things, uh, what people like about Brazilian cotton, what they do not like about it? Uh, the first and foremost is a very positive and encouraging uh, parameter for you. Right now, for all the spinners, the consumption in their product mix is about 25 to 45% of Brazilian cotton. And most of them are saying that the procurement is expected to increase in future. So that's the first thing. Uh, we also asked them about why would you like to buy Brazilian cotton. So the two parameters, the biggest parameters for them to decide which cotton to buy are no surprises price followed by quality. So given the same quality, they will always go for lower price and that's the biggest thing. Uh, we also asked them that how would you position Brazilian cotton vis-a-vis -vis the countries, uh, the other cotton origins. So they said if we compare Brazilian, US and Australian are somewhere at the top, followed by Brazilian cotton if we talk about in terms of strength, uniformity and color grade. But for all the other Asian countries of origin like CIS, Turkish, Indian, West African, so Brazil cotton is perceived to be better. Two biggest challenges in terms of technicality that they reported to us were high short fiber content. The SFI is on a higher side, which, has, which leads to higher wastage. And some of the spinners also reported about stickiness. So these are the two biggest technical challenges that were reported by the spinners. Uh, another challenge which was, another issue that was reported by spinners was the presence of contamination. Ideally speaking, because it's a mechanical pick cotton, there should be no contamination per se. But there were instances of yellow, green, and blue plastic contamination, which was there. And occasional uh, colored uh, plant debris, etc., was also reported. But the biggest issue was having the plastic contamination of color of yellow, blue, and green, which I think is the, uh, the round bale cover which you are using. That is, the, that is the thing which is going as a contamination. And finally, they said that uh, higher lead time than other cotton origins along with some shipment delays and some variation in bale dimensions are the issues that they face which lead to sometime a little difficulty in the bale management at their end. So, so broadly speaking, they want to buy more. They are overall happy. They position Brazil cotton as the second best cotton in the world. Uh, the issues, technical, are stickiness, short fiber content, as well as contamination. Of course, there are there are certain things that can be addressed about it. So all in all, if you see, it's a kind of a positive perception. And with the global trend that people want to move from Chinese originating value chain, so Brazil holds a very good position to tap into that opportunity. Finally, last slide on the concluding remarks, just to summarize what I've been told, what I've been telling for the last 15 minutes, is that the global demand and trade is on the rise with resilient demand for cotton products. We have seen that 
the demand is up on upside as the economy grows as the population grows as the income of developing countries grow they will buy more and more clothing the preference is for cotton it is the supply constraint which is not uh, which is which is keeping cotton at a lower level but if the supply constraint is not there people really value the comfort breathability and versatility of cotton for their clothing for all the purposes and asian economies are definitely the most important players in the industry they are increasing investments the governments are giving very strong support to develop the entire value chain and maybe brazil can also look forward to providing a dedicated policy support to enhance the competitiveness because it's not only the country it could also be a regional export and import that could be looked into so when i was looking at the statistics so it is there that the domestic consumption of cotton cotton is stable for last many many years it's one third of the total output by the time when you try to achieve a from 3.5 when you reach 5 uh in in terms of cotton production then it is important that you not only look outwards but also look for the inwards or regional consumers of the cotton so that will become very important so maybe for 5 years down the line we need to start thinking right now the the demand of cotton brazil cotton is definitely growing with price playing the most important role followed by quality consistency and sustainability and improvement in key challenges for example i mentioned about high short fiber index sickiness and contamination are the key challenges which if can be sorted out and can be sorted out definitely that will actually help the further growth of brazilian cotton with this i would like to end my presentation if there are, are any questions or comments or observations i don't know maybe we can have it now or later thank you so much okay we'll have the questions afterwards in the panel right thank you thank you so much obrigado em um dos principais países compradores da fibra, o Paquistão, com duas edições do Cotton Outlook e visitas a indústrias locais. Também tivemos destaque em um dos maiores eventos da cadeia do algodão, a ICA Trade Event. Já em 2024, uma semana intensa dedicada a eventos de relacionamento, reuniões com entidades setoriais locais e almoços e jantares com executivos chaves dos países. Mais uma ação de relacionamento e realização do Cotton Brasil Outlook em países com números crescentes de importação do algodão brasileiro. Com o mercado recém-aberto, o Egito se tornou um cliente potencial, enquanto a Turquia é um mercado cada vez mais importante para o Brasil. Além disso, estivemos presentes em outros eventos importantes da cadeia global, levando a rastreabilidade do algodão brasileiro para o público do Brasil Investment Forum, 
Falando sobre a inovação da nossa cotonicultura na Conferência Anual da Federação Internacional de Fabricantes de Têxteis, ITMF, na China. E também criamos diálogos valiosos com importantes marcas, varejistas e players do terceiro setor por meio da nossa presença em eventos direcionados a este público e ações específicas. Representando o algodão brasileiro na COP28 e reafirmando o compromisso contínuo com a sustentabilidade produtiva, fomentando uma moda mais responsável e com origem certificada no Kingpins deste ano. E tudo isso graças ao apoio da Apex, que renovou o compromisso de impulsionar o algodão brasileiro pelo mundo. Hoje, ao mesmo tempo que colhemos frutos importantes de um trabalho coletivo, nos preparamos para novos desafios e responsabilidades que virão com nosso crescimento e fortalecimento. Cotton Brasil, Growing for a Better Future. So thank you, Varun. That was a very interesting presentation. We have a lot of uh, cotton growers here who have helped Brazil reach where the point where we have reached in the international markets. And we know that in these missions that you just saw in the video, we always hear a lot about how much more we need to do in a number of aspects in terms of uh, production and delivery of cotton. So it's always good to know what we have to improve on and that there is space to grow into and to improve and that's what we'll be doing from here on. Thank you.